overfishing, plastic pollution, acidification, oil spills, the spread of dead zones. Our oceans are facing two crises, climate change and biodiversity loss. We're chipping away at the very fabric of life in the ocean. We don't understand even a fraction of what is going on in the ocean. How dare we allow it to be destroyed? Right now, countries of the world are in that building negotiating a treaty to turn these things around, but they've taken way too long. Yes. It's been almost 20 years they've been talking about this, and we still don't have a treaty. The reason we're here today is to give them a nudge, to tell them to hurry it up. These are activists from Greenpeace USA who came down, stopped traffic, and unfurled a banner. Saying, Ocean Treaty now? After nearly 36 hours of non-stop negotiations, the delegates finally reached agreement on the new text of the High Sea Treaty. But the story is not over yet. Much work still remains to roll out the treaty as a fully operational international legal instrument capable of managing the high seas. The treaty consists of four pillars or parts. The treaty covers area-based management tools and these include the setting up of marine protected areas, it covers marine genetic resources, including access and benefit sharing. It includes environment impact assessment. It also includes capacity building and transfer of marine technology. Once the treaty has been ratified by 60 or more member states, a new international secretariat comes online. Besides the four subject matter areas of the treaty, the treaty offers institutional measures. It creates what's called a conference of the parties. Countries can get together, they can cooperate, they can deconflict, be more conservation-minded. Governments have to work together to achieve what the treaty says that they should be achieving. It needs to have a conference of the parties, but it also needs a scientific and technical body to analyze proposals for protected areas, for example. Je m'appelle Amte Diop. Je suis du Sénégal et j'habite à Bourg. Je suis transformatrice de produits halieutiques depuis des années. Un métier que j'ai hérité de mes arrière grand mères on a vu depuis ces 25 ans que les produits halieutiques se font plus rares. Il n'y a plus de poissons, ça diminue de année en année. Et la cause peut-être, c'est peut-être une surexploitation des ressources. Le changement climatique, on l'a remarqué depuis lors. On ne voit plus certaines espèces qu'on ne voit qu'on voyait ensemble euh, avant. Il y a aussi les vents qui ont changé aussi les atmosphères. Et quand il y a trop de vent, les pêcheurs ne vont pas en mer. Je pense que si cet accord est signé et que l'on respecte ce qu'on a signé, on aura des résultats. Dans cinq ans, la mer sera et les océans seront plus protégés. Et par la suite, les populations seront plus protégées. As a youth ambassador, my main job is to be an advocate for the youth, where youth is often underrepresented. I feel like the high seas is something that young people don't know too much about, so I think it's really important to spread the word on. When the BBNJ is in effect, it's promoting rules for the high seas, so no one nation can essentially do whatever they want. It's protective of ocean health. Um, it's very focused on equitable solutions. So once we'll have the treaty adopted, it will be really important to raise awareness on this. 
to the general public, but also towards the uh, member states' representatives. We can organize webinars, regional workshops, even before the treaty enters into force. So we will be ready to keep the momentum going. In order to get this treaty operationalized, it's going to require vast cooperation and consultation between nations. But I think everyone that's taking part in this understands the existential threat that our oceans are facing and are apt to work together. When we talk about marine genetic materials, we really talk about the DNA that's inside a lot of living organisms. A lot of the work that's done in the very deep sea, that because they're big organisms are so rare, we tend to just get a sample of mud from the seafloor and, and see what bacteria are in there and then grow them. And because they're isolated from the rest of the world, essentially, quite often these bacteria are really unique. So we tend to grow them in different conditions. High pressure is one of the things you might try with. Or hot vent, a hot smoker, again, those are quite uh, beautiful environments in the deep sea. The PCR test that was done for COVID, that's actually done with a bacterium DNA that comes from a hot vent organism in Baja, California. Once people do find interesting products from the deep sea, that they can commercialize and then share the profits with everybody in the planet. And, and most of that money is going to go straight back into ocean conservation. A lot of the science is already doing things that the treaty wants us to do, but it will bring us together and make the practice better. If we want to protect the large swathe of the ocean, we need a financial mechanism that can support that. Once the treaty has 60 signatures and it enters into force, then the treaty's financing mechanism enters into force as well. The financing mechanism has two components. It has a fixed part, which is called assessed contributions, which covers the cost of running the institutions of the treaty. We also have annual contributions, essentially capacity building for developing countries. So those are the two components that will be available from the start. Another block of money in the form of benefit sharing and royalty payments may also come through what's called the Marine Genetic Resource Mechanism of the Treaty. But these instruments have long-term horizon realities. Any proceeds that are coming out of this uh, Marine Genetic Resource research is to put it into a, a central fund. But of course that will take maybe 10, 20 years before that materializes. The long payout times prove problematic in the final hours of the treaty negotiations. The delegates, however, worked out a solution that included an upfront payment into a fund that could be used immediately for capacity building and ocean conservation work. It's a really important aspect of this treaty that we don't just wait. We actually proactively put money in there so actually you can start operationalizing the treaty. What we can do is get everybody on board, bring the finance to the table, bring science and conservation, integrate traditional knowledge, have all the stakeholders around and get started. Hopefully we'll start seeing effects of the treaty immediately because countries will start developing national laws, not just to adopt the treaty and ratify it, but to actually implement it. The ocean is so vast. We are so small. There is so much to learn out there. Protecting the high seas means protecting this fundamental opportunity to continue to learn about our place in the universe. It's really powerful and I'm so excited to be here and be part of it. Oh, in five years, we'll have a strong COP with many states that are parties to the treaty and who work together to establish protected areas and making sure that the ocean ha is a better place. Scientists have told us that in order to prevent the worst impacts of climate change and biodiversity loss, that we need to protect 30% of the oceans by 2030. And this treaty was a critical part of making that happen. There's a feeling in the room I can already see a change in mood. I think 
delegations are really motivated to get this done. So I'm really looking forward to it. I feel optimistic about it. IUCN and its members have been advocating for a high sea treaty for two decades and have been providing scientific and legal advice to negotiators since the start. Today, we are calling for fast-track adoption and ratification to bring the treaty into force. The Union is offering its continued support to lay the foundation for a rapid, effective and equitable implementation.